Hey guys, um, this is going to be my Victoria 2 um, quick beginner's guide using the Heart of Darkness and a House Divided expansion packs. You need to be using those expansion packs for this game. It's really not functional without them. So, I know there's a lot of countries here, but if you're a newer player, let's just start off in um, Sardinia, Piedmont. And, and de I would definitely recommend starting as a European country. Maybe not the big eight, but maybe something more on the lines of Portugal or Sardinia, Piedmont just to start off. So we're going to go ahead and start off here um, just showing a little bit of the basics. Now, I know there's a lot of stuff on the screen here, but don't worry. We're going to go ahead and just break this down pretty simply for you. The first thing we need to do, just get out of the way very quickly on day one, technology. The first one you want to get is medicine. The reason being is that there are discoveries that you can make here after you've researched the tech, which are pop growth bonuses. Now, the pop growth bonuses help you out through the entirety of the game, and as you'll start to see here, population is king. You have to have a high population to get anywhere in this game, and low populations, I mean, they're not very fun to play with as nations. If you even notice here, but we're going to talk about national focuses in a little bit, but um, I should be getting two national focuses here, but I don't have enough accepted primary popular population to get the full two national focus points. So that kind of blows. Now, after we get medicine, the next technology you're definitely going to want to probably end up getting is in the idealism tree. Um, or philosophy tree, I should say, but you'll get the tech idealism because it opens up at 1840. These essentially give you more research points, which is listed up here, and that basically it tells you directly how many research points you're getting for putting into the next tech. So the more research point modifiers you have that are you know benefiting you, the better. And these techs are pretty much mandatory. I would even save up points before their activation year in order to get them even faster. Okay, now that that's all said and done, the third priority I would consider again is this Max National Focus Tree. Um, and while our country may not really benefit very well from this, other larger countries will because these give you more control over your country and it is very very vital to have as many national focuses working for you at the same time as possible and this is extremely useful when you're starting to industrialize your country later on so let's talk about national focuses <clears throat> first we're gonna go into the regional map mode and the reason why is I just want you to get a feel of like which regions we control Piedmont Savoy, um, a little bit of province, and Sardinia down here. Now, why do I say that? Well, we have this four regions I just mentioned here, and if you notice, our biggest populated region is Piedmont. Now, what you want to do as a rule of thumb here is you want to make sure that every single region in here has the maximum amount of bureaucrats needed to facilitate uh, maximum state administrative efficiency. I know that's a huge mouthful, but what am I saying here? So if I, I want to encourage bureaucrats so over here on the right, you'll see encouraged bureaucrats, and our state administrative efficiency in Piedmont is only 44.3%. We need that to be 100. Now, it doesn't matter, like, where 0.19% of the, the pops in the state are bureaucrats. That doesn't really matter too much. What matters is if we let some time pass is um, that the state administrative efficiency gets closer and closer to 100. Once it hits 100, you'll actually notice this turn red, and that means this is completely useless for you. You can switch it to something else. Now, what do I do after that? Well, I would go down the tabs here and do the same thing. Make sure that every state has the maximum administrative efficiency. However, in Sardinia's case, we have a problem, and that is if you look at Sardinia, we, we have full South Italians. Now, South Italians aren't an accepted pop in our country. If you go to diplomacy, um, we only have North Italians accepted. Once we turn to Italy, we'll have both accepted, but um, unfortunately for right now, North Italians aren't accepted. Well, why is that a problem? Well, you can't encourage bureaucrats efficiently in um, states that don't have accepted POPs. They, they don't want to become bureaucrats and start managing their own people and trying to tax the people that aren't accepted even in their own country. So it makes a little bit of sense. Um, same problem with Savoy. They're all French. Um, and Piedmont uh, province we actually have North Italians here, but there's such a small amount of the pops that make up of our total population, it may not even be worth throwing bureaucrats um, or trying to use our one national focus to encourage bureaucrats here. In fact, what I would do is start in Piedmont, 
and actually start encouraging clergymen. Clergymen, um, you want to go for about 2%, and the reason why you want to encourage for clergymen in the first place is they directly influence your literacy rate and how efficient um, your populace starts becoming literate. Now, if you notice, we're at 34%. You need at least 30% to start going into an industrial, um, uh, start having like factories and whatnot. Um, and if you have even lower than that, don't even bother building factories. So you want to have a very literate populace because a literate populace is a happy populace. Now, after you hit about 2% clergymen, um, and, don't, and also a note is um, you can encourage clergymen in these other provinces. They don't necessarily have to be accepted pops. So you can, get, um, you can improve your literacy in that way, and it may be worth um, getting 2% here and 2% there. Just remember, because they don't have the bureaucratic bonuses that Piedmont will, you probably won't get them as efficiently. But afterwards, if you're feeling comfortable in all these different states, you may want to go for a four point, per, uh, sorry, four point, uh, four percentage uh, of clergymen here. That'll get you like the most efficient process and trying to get as close to a hundred percent literacy rate before the game ends. And you actually get a, you, you can take full advantage of the fact that you have a literate populace rather than only getting about 80% literacy at the very end of the game. So I wouldn't go over 4%, however, and clergymen do start uh, asking for a lot of wages later on. Speaking of wages, I think we should go ahead and talk about the budget now. Um, this looks really complicated, but it's really not. Very simple. Tax the shit out of the poor. Don't tax the shit out of the middle class. Tax the shit out of the rich. And also turn tariffs up to 100%. Now, why do I do all that? Well, really, because we're encouraging uh, middle class pops, um, the way they get encouraged, so to speak, is pops from different classes have to jump to them. Now, for instance, in the poor, we have a lot of farmers and laborers and whatnot, but you know, we really, really need these bureaucrats as soon as possible. So we want to make sure that it, these guys in the, in the poor bracket are as miserable as possible so they become bureaucrats. Now, <clears throat> you need educated people to become bureaucrats, so that's why literacy is also super important. Now anyways, um, over here in the sliders, we can encourage people based on wages. This isn't as super effective, and honestly, as you get up to 100% administrative of country efficiency, you don't need bureaucrats anymore, so you can definitely crank that sucker down. Maybe we might want to keep it up a little bit higher now because we aren't near 100%, but you get my drift. Everything else here is about encouraging people to become different pops. So, I mean, if soldiers don't get paid anything, you won't find a lot of people really wanting to switch over to become a soldier pop when you start encouraging them. So, I mean, but if you've got enough money to make sure everybody's happy, hell, why not? Just pay everybody their full wages. Sardinia Piedmont can't do that, unfortunately. Now, let's talk a little bit about our production. Now, I don't want to get too heavily involved with this because industry can be a little overly complicated, but for the most part, I'm just going to say that we're going to build two factories at Sardinia Piedmont, and we're going to start in our our sorry our largest region which is Piedmont because that's the uh, one area where we can encourage the most workers to work in our factories now the reason why that's important is because industrial power is gauged not by how many factories you have or how big they are but how many people are actually utilizing the factory and creating the products that you need to sell in the global market now we want to pick a winery factory and a glass factory and the reason why is because glass is needed to make wine and not just glass but fruit is needed to make wine and wine is a good that's in high demand if we look at our trade here we go high in high demand the supply is not meeting the demand by almost double the supply so wineries are a really good option to build right now and glass is also in high demand and we definitely need glass to make wine now if we look at our production of, of natural resources, we're making a lot of fruit, not making a ton of coal, but our deficient in coal will be made up for by the profit that we make overall in wine. So why do we have so much fruit? I don't know. We live in Italy and Piedmont has a lot of fruit in it. And if you build factories that require a natural resource in a a state that has those natural resources, you get even more efficiency bonuses on your factory, which means more profit. That's essentially factories in a nutshell. Don't get too worried if your factories are going under. It happens to me all the time. 
Um, let's go over politics very, very briefly. Um, you have decisions that are available to you. Please don't ignore these. I mean, this is how you basically become Italy, and you need to meet the requirements here. Very worth reading into and paying attention to them when they're um, applicable. Over here in the reforms, um, you don't really have an uh, you don't have much of an option uh, with this until your population starts getting pissed off at you, which they will as liberalism rises across the century. Um, you can, if you are worried that the rebels are going to overwhelm you, you can give them what they want, and they'll usually quiet off. But if you're like me, and you want to start pushing socialist reforms through as, as soon as possible, um, try and keep them pissed off enough at you without rebelling in order to pressure the upper house into enacting social reforms. The reason why is if you look down here, you can get more pop growth. This is extremely useful for you and your country. All right, that being said, how do I declare war on other countries? Well, it's very simple in here. I would say even more so than EU4. Um, you just find a country you don't like. You decrease their relations. Like, I have too many relations with France, but say for the United Kingdom, I can justify a war. There's all these different casus bellies. If you notice, I can incur infamy um, if I'm detected. And trust me, you will be detected. It is very easy to be detected in this game. And you need to make sure that your infamy up here is listed and you do not go over 25. Otherwise, you're going to get a horrific, uh, just like imagine if you're in the HRE and you're a one province miner and you decide to declare war on everybody around you and you're an absolute madman and you, you accumulate so much AE that everybody in Europe hates you and wants to kill you in a coalition war. That's essentially what happens here if you go over 25. I know it seems a little arbitrary, but that's just how it is in this game. That being said, once you finally uh, justified a war claim and you want to go to war, well, we need to start talking about the military. Now, it seems pretty simple here, very similar to EU4 if you're familiar with that game, but um, let's just go very briefly over how wars and battles work in this game. So we're going to combine all our troops here. The army composition here is actually really bad, so let's talk about army composition. Very simple, for a very beginning army, I would suggest going with five regular infantry, um, one, let's, let's look at it in the build army tab, um, five regular infantry, one hussar, and four artillery. And I don't want to go too much into the specifics as to why that's a good combo, but essentially it's going to be a very efficient army um, composition, and you can even beat a lot of AI armies just based on the, the balance of that um, army composition. Outside of that, if you notice, we can only build one more regiment. And that's because our military pops are not very high. Now, don't worry, we can encourage soldier pops like I mentioned earlier, but remember, we only have 900,000 people to work with, and many of them don't really want to be a part of our country because they're unaccepted pops. So, with all that kept in mind, you're a small country. You're not going to have a big army. That's just how it works. You could be the richest country in the world, but you really need to start looking for big, powerful allies to make sure that they can help you out. Or, better yet, just play a big, powerful nation and you don't really have to worry about that problem. Now, with all that said, um, I do want to mention very quickly with the way the combat works, it is very similar to EU4. If you notice, we have um, dice rolls here, and they are affected by attack and defense rolls. Now, I can't show it to you in a battle right now, but I do want to make a comment here. This isn't like EU4 in the sense that the entire game, your technology basically will let you run roughshod over your opponents. Now, technology does play a huge factor. But this game tries to gear battles in a way to where it starts to try to emulate the way board, uh, battles were actually fought. When you start getting closer towards War 1, you'll notice that it actually pays better um, to not necessarily engage forces, but rather have them engage you. And the reason why I say that is if you look in the army tabs here, you'll notice that the, the technologies start reducing combat width by a significant margin. And when you look at um, the bonuses here, well, this is all attack, but if you look at um, the machine gun tech, all of the regiments here get massive defense bonuses. And that is also um, uh, magnified or I should say even multiplied by these defense uh, army doctrine uh, techs. Not only do they give extra dig and cap bonuses, but they also give even more defense bonuses to all these regiments. So you're going to start noticing a trend where by the time you get to the late game, 
if you're the one attacking armies constantly, you're going to be in, uh, taking tons and tons of casualties. And that's not even getting into the military directionism, which you start learning gas attack capability and gas defense capability. Basically, if you get to this point and you don't have gas defense and you're fighting someone who has gas attack, just don't fight them. You're going to lose people left and right. Now, with all that said and done, that's a general basic overview of what you should be doing with your military. Boats are fairly simplistic. They work very, very similar to EU-4. Um, you don't have to worry too much about pops um, when you make boats, thankfully, but you do have to worry about the massive cost that they take. So if you notice here, that's like half of my, um, almost half of my, my uh, expenditure is just on like a couple of boats. So if we just decided to delete our seven boats here, um, we would actually be making a lot more money, which I may even recommend for doing as a, as a Sardinia Piedmont start. But anyways, I think I pretty much covered all the, the major aspects of this game. The one thing I did not cover is spheres of influence and the way the great powers work, but I believe that's something that you'll learn as time goes on, and you'll learn the pain of what happens when you get into someone's sphere of influence and you can't tear off the shit out of your people anymore. But I'll leave that to you to find out and play on your own, and I hope that you really enjoy this game for what it's worth, even though it is an older Paradox Interactive game. I'll also put in the description a couple of mods that I think add hundreds of hours of longevity to this game, and I think are definitely worth checking out. Anyways, I hope this guide helps you guys out who are very, very new to this game, and I'm sorry that it ran on a little bit longer than the others that I've done, but I hope that helped you out, and bye-bye.